All right, thank you so much for all coming to this event. My name is Carl Ponto. My company is called Squash and Stretch Productions, and I am upset. There is a lack of connection in the world. Even before COVID, social media had people feeling more alone than ever. People are craving connections, a sense of belonging, and want to feel part of something bigger than themselves that gives meaning to their lives. This is a huge opportunity for each of you and your companies. An opportunity to tell emotionally charged stories on social media to build a community of investors, clients, and employees around your brand. By meeting their needs with this community, your company can achieve incredible levels of success. So to kick things off, I'm gonna set a good example by telling you my own story about why I started my company. And this will be kind of a benchmark for the sort of stories you wanna be telling for your business as well. So I've been an, an artist my entire life. I grew up drawing, painting, sculpting, big Legos kid. And I got my passion for storytelling from my dad. He's a really good storyteller. And I knew I wanted to study animation when I saw the first Toy Story film. I was like, ooh, that, I gotta do that, that's so cool. And then beginning of 2002, I started to feel like something wasn't quite right with me physically. I had been a competitive swimmer my whole life, so I knew what I was supposed to feel like. And it wasn't like, oh, my shoulder kind of hurts. It's like a general blah feeling. But by August, they still hadn't figured out what was wrong with me. And I'd lost 50 pounds and had sunken cheeks and eyes. I was really pale, started to get really bad headaches. So my parents took me for an MRI up in Walnut Creek. And we were waiting around for another appointment when my pediatrician called and said he's going to drive up from Pleasanton to come talk with us. And we saw him walking up this big envelope in his hands. You could tell he'd been crying. And he brought us into a little side meeting room. And I remember I was sitting knee to knee with him, this big U-shaped chair with a really high armrest, kind of leaning forward towards him. And he pulled out the results of the MRI and showed me I had two brain tumors. And it felt like I got punched in the chest, I actually moved backwards in my chair. And for the next two weeks, everything sounded like the adults from Peanuts, kind of womp, 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 because never had the flu, never broken any major bones, never been stung by a bee. I'm pretty sure I've never been bitten by a mosquito. So to get brain tumor diagnosis at 15 year years old was a complete sucker punch out of nowhere. But I got so much help from friends and family and my high school adjusted my schedule and got me a tutor so I could still graduate on time. And People I barely knew were giving food and gifts and other supports really inspired me to want to give back and help as many people as I could because I'd probably be dead if it wasn't for all the help that I got. And then in undergraduate schools, I was studying animation. There was a big student digital art and design competition I participated in with a big screening at the end of like a thousand people in this big auditorium. I knew maybe 10 people in the room. But when everyone laughed at the joke of my animation, I was like, oh my gosh, it's so cool. I can connect with people and have a bigger impact with animation and storytelling. So after grad school, I started my company. And we tell exceptional stories for exceptional impact, helping tech, biotech, healthcare, and professional services companies attract more of their best clients, investors, and employees using storytelling and animation. By helping companies that are solving big problems facing the world, like curing cancer, preventing Alzheimer's, reversing climate change, renewable energy, uh, more and more people in the world get their lives improved, our clients' business does better, we get a happy client, everyone wins. It's a way for me to have a bigger positive impact on the world around me, and that's why I do what I do. So here's a roadmap of what we're gonna be covering today in this workshop. Uh, there will be some interactive elements so I have the chat window available so you can participate. Uh, first step after the intro is basically we're gonna be covering common messaging mistakes to avoid in your marketing and on social media. Part two is messaging that builds your network and gets results. Part three is how to use LinkedIn for maximum effect. Then there'll be a special opportunity and then we'll end with some Q and A. So launching right into mistake number one that you definitely want to avoid, which is focusing too much on your company and what you do. Harsh truth is that nobody cares about what you do or what your company does. Even you don't really care about the what part of it. I will explain why this is true in the next section, but for now, just know that except in a couple places on your profile and on your business page, you should really not be talking about your company or what you do in your marketing and your uh, messaging online. Mistake number two to avoid, hard selling in posts, comments, and direct messages on LinkedIn. Uh, go ahead and put it in the chat, type a one. If you like getting unsolicited emails from people trying to sell you stuff in the chat, if you don't like it, put a two in the chat. Let's see how many people love getting unsolicited emails in the chat. So put one if you enjoy it, two if you do not. Lots of twos, I saw one one so far. 
who likes getting unsolicited emails. Lots of twos. Oh, there's some ones. Mostly twos. Mostly twos. All right. Yeah. So vast majority of people. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, Narges says uh, five twos. Okay. It definitely doesn't like it. Okay. That makes sense. Um, so don't do it to other people. I mean, people use LinkedIn to network and build professional relationships. Most are not ready to buy anything. And so if you spam people with salesy content, you're just gonna get yourself banned. And that's a big problem for your business if you can't even use LinkedIn at all. So um, next big mistake to avoid is polluting people's feeds with jargon monoxide, which is my new favorite term for this sort of thing. So who here has ever tried reading a legal contract and not known what the heck was going on because it's in like legalese? If so, again, type a one in the chat if you had trouble reading a contract or like an insurance document and it's like you've read something and have no idea what it is. Or if you haven't ever had that issue and know, know immediately what all those legal jargon terms are, then put a two in the chat. But hopefully you'll see a lot of ones here where you're trying to read something and someone's, it's just so obtuse and hard to understand that you have no idea what you're reading, yeah. Seeing lots of ones. So when it comes to your posts, people are in a rush and they don't have time or the attention span to read a long, drawn out post full of industry specific terms. So even if your intended audience are your peers who speak the same lingo, the more difficult it is to read your content, the less of an impact it will have. Um, you wanna use really short words, break up the paragraphs, write like a, like a sixth grade reading level and really keep it simple and uh, like more conversational, less like you're writing like a research paper because um, people are looking to make connections. So that's mistake number three. So those are some of the, the most common things people flub up on. And so you want to avoid those. So now let's go on to part two, which is messaging that's going to get you the results you want. So I talked before about not talking about what you do. So what are you supposed to talk about? So there's actually three things your audience really cares about when it comes to your business. And they're gonna go on kind of the foundations up to the tippy top here. So first is why you do what you do, also known as your company's mission. This is a super, super important. You wanna know, basically base all your kind of content off of this uh, foundation. On top of that is how you do what you do. Basically all like the, the client experience you provide and what they, go through when they're working with your company. And then the top is the results of the results of what your clients enjoy by working with you. So what is the impact it has? And that's often not the initial impact, but the secondary impact where the real value is found. So we're gonna be breaking these things down next to explain how this works, but really think about it. Basically it's why, how, results. And by explaining these things, the what will be understandable as part of this messaging. But if you uh, don't, if you just go straight to the what, no one really gets the importance of it. So focus on these three. Let's, let's break them down next. So why? You heard my why story at the beginning. And at the end of it was my company's mission statement. And so if you're the founding member of your company, then your business hopefully is an extension of your personal mission. And you want to have some sort of impact on the world. And so you started this company uh, to have that impact. So what kind of impact are you looking to have on the world? Go and type in the chat. I'd love to see what people... What impact do you want to have on the world with your company? Go ahead and share that in the chat right now. I'm like one sentence, no more than that. What impact do you want to have on the world? I'd love to see what people's goals are. The deck will be available afterwards. Yes, as well be a recording and I'll be sending you a whole bunch of goodies as well. Raise healthy life expectancy to 80. Oh, nice. Powering women, nice. Helping others by helping myself, okay. New cancer therapies, nice. Coupling houses, not, not okay, cool. Uh, global access to go. Cool. Wow, seems some good impacts here. All right, and so the next part is why does making that impact matter to you? Go ahead and put that in your chat as well. So, what is the what is the personal like? What do you gain from having that impact? What is your motivation for making that impact? I'm loving these in the, these missions. This is great. Um, healthy healing relationships, more productivity, inclusivity, nice. Cool, so that is your real mission. That is 
what you need to basically infuse into every marketing, recruiting, fund seeking, and operational action your company takes. It's not just something you put in the business plan and put on the like on the a, like a flyer on the wall in the break room. You want to make this infused into your business. I'm going to this a little bit more later. Um, so your why and your mission directly influences how you do what you do, also known as kind of the client experience you provide. And as technology and automation continue to advance, more and more products and services are getting commoditized. And actually now it's 89% of companies now compete on client experience as the main differentiator. So if you can explain what clients experience in working with you, it increases the perceived value of your product or service, and it, which sets higher expectations for your clients, which actually leads to them having a better experience. Just a higher expectation leads to that better experience. It's actually a great st uh, study they did. It was in a restaurant. Over the course of the day, the food didn't change at all in this restaurant, but they would swap out the weight of the silverware at certain tables. When people had heavier silverware, they thought the food tasted better. So how that higher expectation led to a better experience. And you set a higher expectation by increasing the perceived value by explaining what people will experience, setting that expectation with your marketing messaging and focusing on that in your content. So the key though, is to not explain the experience from your perspective, but from the client's perspective. Once you get done talking about why you do what you do, you're no longer the hero of your story, you are the guide. And you wanna make your clients the hero and explain the experience from their perspective. Um, talking about like, you'll experience this, you'll go through this, you'll enjoy this. And by using evocative and emotional language, you'll immerse them in the story and they'll be able to see themselves working with you and see themselves having the results of your uh, experience you provide, which again is basically leading right into the results. So again, in the chat, uh, please let me know who here has a favorite piece of fruit. Please type in the chat your favorite type of fruit, apple, mango, Pineapple, what's your favorite piece of fruit? Mango, yes, a durian, oh nice, banana, orange, nice, 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 jackfruit, I hadn't heard of that one, grapefruit, papa, cool, great, mango, all right, so why do you eat that piece of fruit? It is not because of what it intrinsically is. You eat it because it tastes good and has nutrients. That's the first result of eating that fruit. The second result is that you enjoy the experience of eating the fruit and it helps you live a longer, healthier, happier life. That's why you really eat that piece of fruit. Not because of what it is, but the result of the result. So the same thing applies for your business. What are the results of using your product or service? How does it make your clients feel? What can they do now that they couldn't do before? That's what you wanna be focusing on in your marketing messaging, on your posts on LinkedIn, on your website, other social media platforms, your presentations, all that stuff. And if you do it right, your why mission feeds into the how, the client experience you provide, which results in the results that they care about, which if you're doing it right, is basically what you said you're gonna be providing in your mission statement. Your whole purpose for existing is to provide these results and spread this impact. So if you tell this story right, this why, how results, it loops right back around to you're fulfilling this mission for your business and that is incredibly powerful. So starts with the why, goes to how, goes through results to results, and then loops back around. So some people are a little skeptical sometimes that this is actually as effective as I claim it is. So we have some scientific and market-based evidence to address your concerns and show you just how powerful this can be for your business. So first of all, the science. As much as we like to think of ourselves as thinking beings that feel, we are very much feeling beings that occasionally think. And we make decisions using emotion every single time. Everybody does it, even you. It's the limbic system of our brains. And there's a great book called Predictably Irrational uh, written by MIT professor Dan Ariely. And he shows through a number of experiments that while humans don't behave rationally, there are systems that govern our decision-making processes. And if you know, what those systems are and how they work, you can create prompts and messages that will lead to the results you want uh, in your marketing messaging and in your uh, inspirational messages. So also in the brain area comes the secret to why stories are so powerful. And it's because we are wired to organize and communicate information in a narrative format. Uh, storytelling is not just a, like a marketing strategy or a tool. It is part of what makes us human. 
So here's a little uh, exercise helping to demonstrate this. So in the next five seconds, think of your favorite statistic. All right, in the next five seconds, think of your favorite story. So if you're like most people, you probably had trouble thinking of a single statistic that you'd label as your favorite um, because you don't really associate that adjective with numbers and data. And you probably had trouble narrowing down all the potential stories that popped in. You had to pick one single favorite from the entire list of things you've experienced over the course of your life. So mirror neurons are something in our brains that allow us to empathize with characters and situations without having to actually experience them ourselves. And so when you're, if you're watching like a scary movie, the reason why it's so exciting uh, is because your brain can't tell the difference between the character on screen being chased by the axe wielding psychopath and you being chased by it. Your body receives the same way physically just from watching a character you empathize with, you connect with going through the experience. So if you want to elicit an emotional response and decision from your audience, storytelling is the way to do it. And this applies for all sorts of companies out there. There's only really one business type out there. People think of, oh, I'm a B2C business, I'm a B2B business, or even a B2G business, business to government. But really, all companies are the same, which is H to H. It is human to human. As we just established, humans love stories. So that's kind of the science behind it in a nutshell. Here are some real world examples of companies who have used these same techniques to amazing results. So who here has heard of these brands before? Apple, they're all about client experience. They are the masters of, the, of it. They've, I've heard stories about how they took a guy, a guy's computer who had basically had spilled coffee on it like the day before a big keynote he's gonna give. He's being paid like six grand, so 600, six figures to give this big keynote address. And he spilled coffee on the keyboard like the day before, brought into the Genius Bar. They took the hard drive out, which is still working, put into a new computer, shipped the new computer to where he was giving the address before he got there. He picked it up after his flight, computer worked and it was fine. All done, not under warranty, but he is a client for life for them because they went above and beyond to provide an exceptional service. And that's because they follow this kind of this mission-driven, emotional uh, experience focused service. Coca-Cola, they are all about their marketing, about ex the experience of drinking their product, the fun, social interactions, going to the beach, to the barbecue, not what they actually make. What they make is disgusting and awful for you. It's terrible, but they're the biggest soft drink company in the world because they don't sell you on the what, they sell you on the experience and the results of the experience, which is having fun with your friends and experiencing life. And then Nike, their shoes are technically not like better or well-made than any other brands, but they're, they got their start by focusing on it, their mission, which is empowering women athletes and girls to achieve greatness and have more confidence in their lives. That's what their marketing has been about for the entire time they've been around. So these are might be a little too easy examples. They've been around for a while. They've been well more well established. Let's look at some newer brands. You might be, you might relate to more. Tom's. Tiny shoe company starting off. How'd they grow to be a huge industry to something giant? Buy one, give one. All about the mission. They're basically, if you buy a pair of Tom's shoes, they're going to donate one to a family in need, person in need in a developing country. It'll make the best shoes, but the societal impact that mission is very, very powerful, especially for millennials and Gen Z. So effective was this strategy that Warby Parker for sunglasses or like reading glasses did the exact same thing. They basically offer the same buy one, give one, but they went a step further and they basically made their experience of buying their glasses exceptionally uh, easy. You basically you order like five frames you think you like, you try them on. If you don't, the ones you don't want, you ship back and you basically pay for the ones you keep. And it's super easy. And so the experience of buying glasses, they made that really easy and, it, and they made it fun. And they have this, uh, this great mission and impact they're making if you buy their glasses. And so now they're disrupting the glasses market. And Airbnb, again, started off tiny startup. People like, who's going to want to have people stay in their house? Well, their mission, their message is all about creating a sense of belonging wherever you are in the world. And that's incredibly powerful. And so now they're, they've grown immensely successful and they're disrupting kind of the hospitality world. And so all of these companies are what's known as mission with a business companies. They're not a business that happens to have a mission statement. They are driven by their, their mission. 
They're all startups just like yours that use their missions to build a community of rabid fans that ended up disrupting their respective industries. They use the same approaches we've covered so far. It's not a new thing, it's just not common. And these days, with what's happened with COVID and uh, the great resignation and all the craziness going on in, in Ukraine and like inflation, this is now just essential for businesses to succeed because people want to feel that connection and they want to be part of something bigger. So now they kind of know what you should be saying on LinkedIn, let's talk about how to use LinkedIn for the maximum effect. <clears throat> uh, all right, so starting with your profile, and yes, this is my profile snapshot here. Um, this is one of the few spots, few spots you wanna focus on what you do, mainly for SEO optimization purposes. Uh, Google's little crawler thingies go through your LinkedIn profile and if you have like the, I have like storytelling coach and animation producer, those are the what things that aren't really super exciting, but it helps for, for SEO purposes. And then I, this next part here is more about who I'm working, who I'm working with. Again, the, the results of working with me, um, a little bit of like a tagline and some more what stuff here, just for clarification, but the, this is like the only real spot where I focus on what my company does. Um, and this headline here is really important because the, the SEO weights it uh, a lot heavier than like the body of your other parts of your your um, your profile, especially like you may, like I have the story maker little tagline in my name here because that's even weighted more. So um, that's a great start to your profile is having these sort of elements uh, to make sure that people know exactly what to expect from the rest of your profile. Moving on to the about page or about section. This is an area where a lot of people make some common mistakes. I want to address those. Um, for a while, it was kind of a, a trendy thing to write it in third person. Don't make it first person. You're trying to build relationships and connections with people. You don't want to sound like it was written by like an assistant or a third person. You want to make sure it's like you're having a conversation with someone. Um, and this is a great place to put your why story. So many people put like, the awards they've won or how long they've been in business or where they went to school and all the certifications they have. And there are separate sections down below for that at the end of your profile. And the reason why they're down at the end is because most people don't care about those things. They wanna know about you as a person. And so for here, I, I start with, again, kind of like the, the mission, what, I, what my, who I help and that sort of stuff. And I have some examples of clients I've worked with. And then down here is another version of that why story I told you obviously to fit within the character limit, you have to be kind of creative to make sure it doesn't get um, too long, but it's that sort of story that gets people to really feel like they know you. And if you share that sort of story, you become more vulnerable to people. Um, it's a great way to invite them to share about themselves. And if once you kind of shown you've heard them speak, hear their story and show you understand them, that's when a connection is made. That's when the trust occurs. And once you have that trust, that connection, that's where you're able to get the client or the investor or the employee or the referral partner. But it takes building that trust and the fastest way to build that trust is to put your why story, your kind of mission, your reason for doing what you're doing in your about section so people get to know you and not just what you do. So don't waste this with like a two line thing about <clears throat> what your company does or like where you're from, that sort of stuff. You want to tell that story because it builds connections so fast. Next up in the experience section, um, there's like a few little tweaks here that really can help you or kind of tricks that'll help make your experience section a lot more powerful. Um, again, SEO is really important for this part. So I have uh, added a lot more kind of keywords in here about the what and, and who sort of things there. But this is the one of the only place, only real place you want to put sales content. Um, at the bottom here, I have my main entry for my business, which has some good, good links and stuff in there to like content we've made. But these top two are basically two different kind of landing page sort of sales um, <clears throat> pitches for services I provide. And um, so, but like down here, before you get too far, there's uh, like the mission of the business and uh, like the how, re the why, how, and results section here, not the what down here, but for these two up here I have basically, if you see, it is like a sales pitch, but 
If you put it here, it's fine because people visit your page, your profile voluntarily. No one gets like redirected forcefully to your profile page. So if you're out there putting out content that people experience and they like and they find value from it, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and then they want to check out your profile, they're they're expecting to want to learn more. They want to see what, what's going on there. They're, they've basically bought into um, this sort of messaging. So it's not nearly as disruptive or annoying as the cold stuff or like constant uh, sales pitch you see online. So uh, this is one of the few places to really uh, emphasize the sales part of your, your content. Um, and then uh, I think I'll further down, I have a little call to action at the bottom and some more links to information about this offer. So, um, and again, spicing it up with some emojis is great because people see all just a big block of text, it gets really boring. So again, small words, space things out, don't have this huge like blocks of text because people see that and their eyes glaze over and they stop reading. Um, getting to posting now. So posting is, is tricky because most people think, oh, what am I supposed to write about? And, they, and they're not sure. So they default again to the what they do or the things they care about. And uh, again, nobody cares about the what and don't really care about the things you do and the way you think they care about it. So the first step when creating any sort of post that I highly recommend people use is What's the result you want to get from this post? What is the call to action? What is the um, impact you want this post to have? What do you want people to do after they've read it? Have that in mind <coughs> and then take a step back and ask, who is the target audience for this post? Who am I speaking to? And what do they care about? What are their values? What are their pain points? What do they... How do they view my business? What point are they in the sales process? Are they, are they even aware they have a problem? Do they, uh, are they know there's a problem? They're not sure what the solutions are. Are they aware of the solutions, but not that my solution exists? Know who you're talking to. And you'll be really, really granular. If you think my, you're like your target audience is, is like anyone with a spine who's breathing, you're wrong. You need to make it way more focused. Think of a single person, a single person like you're talking directly to them and you'll just write it in a way that's a lot more personable and warm and welcoming and less corporate and business-like, and that's exactly what you want to avoid sounding out like on LinkedIn is too corporate and business-like. Um, and you want to give away value. Uh, like for this post here, it's basically, I have a, it's a snippet of a business storytelling guide I made. Um, so it's giving away some free value. And when you give away value on your post, people want to reciprocate. They want to give back. They want more help because they'll think like, oh my gosh, this is super helpful. I got it for free. Imagine if I was a client of theirs, how much more value that I would get from working with them. And so again, it's that those mirror neurons, people want to reciprocate and uh, they don't, they want to feel like they owe you anything. So if you give away some value, um, then they're going to want to reciprocate and going to even those scales. So rarely no more than once or twice per week, can you really promote yourself? Like do some sort of kind of a more, like here's a service or like, opportunity we're offering if you do, do always if you're always posting about like buy 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 our stuff people will turn you out no one's going to follow you you'll just be seen as this kind of sales bot and it won't help you build the sort of connections you need to get the results you want so um post should be adding value for your target audience you should really be focused on a specific audience every time you post and think about what you want them to do afterwards and a great it's like a great call to action for these posts is check out my profile because that's where the salesy stuff is. But if you invite them to kind of visit, then it's easier to just click on the name of the who posted it. It takes them right there, but it's not a uh, hard sell. And it doesn't disrupt like, or it doesn't like upset the algorithm, which we'll go into a little, little bit later. And then direct messages. Again, do not cold sell. This is an example of a email I got from someone last week. And I didn't reply because I like, oh my God, it's the salesy thing. But then between this message and the time I actually like uh, emailed them back because they emailed me, they texted me, they called me and like left voicemail and said, I'm, I don't need your services. Stop bombarding me with like unsolicited messages. And so I was just, I'm, I was, I was so annoyed by this guy. I figured I'd use him as an example. So instead of cold selling to people, whether or not they're a good fit for you, research someone's profile, show some interest in them comment on a bunch of their posts first. 
um, follow them so you can see when they when they post that sort of thing. Start some conversations on their in their comments and their posts before you invite them to connect with you. And remember, you're talking to a human. And if you want to get something from them, it's best the best way to do it is to give what that you want to them. So again, offering some valuable advice or offering to um, chat with them. And then if you're if you're there's a great thing you can do, which is if someone connects with you. If you're on like you're using your phone or like a tablet, a mobile device, the app, you can use the camera to send a short little 30 second, like welcome, thank you uh, video instead of text to say, hey, thank you so much for connecting with me. I saw in your profile X, Y, and Z. Uh, if you want to check out my profile, here's a link right there. And you're going to point to the upper left above your head because that's where the link will be. Um, and then as if you want to connect, please send me like a, a link to your calendar page so we can book a time for us to chat and get to know each other. 30 seconds, really short, warm, smiled the whole time. And that's way more of a natural humans connecting with humans sort of thing than uh, what you see on the screen here, which just makes me like bristle and I'm really annoyed when I get these things. Um, and so, and it's just way more effective than cold selling. So outsmarting the algorithm, uh, there are some tricks here uh, to uh, apply and some things to avoid uh, that'll help you make sure your posts get the most visibility. Um, so the first one is avoiding third-party links. So LinkedIn gets money from ads. So they want people to stay on their site. So whenever they, it sees that you put a link to like your page, a YouTube video, a news article, anything that takes people off of the LinkedIn page, the algorithm, cuts it off at the knees. They just basically, like it, it doesn't get nearly as much visibility because they don't want people to leave their site. So you can put in the main body saying, hey, I have a link to whatever this is and I'm talking about in the comments. So post the thing, the algorithm goes, okay, here's what it's about. I don't see any third party links, cool. Put the link in the comments right away. It's one extra step. It's harder to automate, but it just, it'll, you'll avoid getting uh, docked by the algorithm. Next is proper hashtags, using hashtags right. So um, if you use like a special custom hashtag that no one else is using, it's you're just wasting typing energy on it from your fingers because no one's going to see it. So if you start to put in a little hashtag thing and you see the suggested ones at the bottom when you're typing in a post, it often links the like the autofill ones as the, as the, the ones that are used the most, seen the most by the most people. So like business is a really big one. Business uh, like tips is probably like a smaller subset. So you want to kind of find the the um, the ones for your business that are uh, the best fit that also have, also have a good following. You can follow a specific hashtag as well. If you like do it on the search bar in LinkedIn, you can search for a specific hashtag and then follow it. So you'll see more posts from those um, people that use that hashtag. Um, so kind of figure out which hashtags are the right ones for your business. And do like three to five. You don't want to just hashtag like 20 things because uh, it's just, I think there's a penalty for that now, but so three to five decent hashtags is good. and It'll help you, your post be seen by more of your target audience. Again, uh, rarely promote the, the algorithm can tell from like the text you use if you're promoting something, even if it's like an event on LinkedIn, it still doesn't like that. Um, so it's gonna be kind of tricky to promote things. So if you do it once in a while, it's fine. Uh, because you'll be building up enough of a following with the other posts that are doing well. Um, but it can tell when you're promoting. And the type of posts that actually do really well that get the most engagement are polls, videos, and PDFs. So polls are great because it, it gets people clicking on the options and there usually starts a good dialogue if you've set it up correctly. Um, so doing a, you don't want to do a poll like all the time because people are doing a lot, like tend to overdo it and it gets kind of annoying. Um, but doing it one, once in a while is really with a really kind of uh, inspiring or kind of poignant uh, question can lead to some great uh, conversations and, uh, and engagement. Videos are growing in popularity for a while. Videos weren't as effective on LinkedIn as other uh, social media channels, but they're starting to creep up again. You don't see as many views on those because it, it hit people to watch it for three seconds, but like a one view on a video is considered like five views on a normal post. So they're still really great. Keep your video short, two minutes or less. Uh, people just don't, again, have the time to watch a 10-minute video unless they've like already kind of know your 
uh, your brand and it's worth following. So <clears throat> try and keep them short and sweet. And then um, PDFs, like I showed you that business storytelling guide from before, it's a little five slide PDF um, that gets a ton of views and engagement because it's giving people a lot of value and they get to click through it. And it's really like, there's like the clicking reward for little dopamine hits when they click through each page, that sort of stuff. Um, so uh, those are really great types of posts to create. You can't always, like, so the, you can't automate the posting of like polls or PDFs, but you can with the video. So some of the stuff you do, um, like, I guess like analog kind of posting it yourself <clears throat> to make sure it shows up at the right time. And then um, to get really like that algorithm boost to get seen by a ton of people to have it kind of go viral, so to speak, you need to get 15 likes and comments in the first two hours to get boosted. So there's, I, I'm in a little pod, there's a group, a, a, a company called beep to b and they have like, you get connected with 14 other people and you support each other's posts and it helps you kind of get that extra boost with the algorithm. Those might be helpful. Some people like them, some people don't. But it's one way to, uh, kind of use the algorithms um, coding to get more visibility for your posts. And so it's, uh, it could be a useful tool if, it's worth, if you think it's worth the investment. So a few other assorted tips for using LinkedIn. So first one is be different. This is basically for all your marketing. Um, there are so many things competing for your audience's attention these days more than ever, and it's only getting worse. There's just so much content out there. And so uh, if it doesn't stand out, if it's not different, it just gets lost in all the noise. So the more you, it, it, different is good, but then you also have to be up, make sure it, like, it appeals to your audience and actually like it inspires them to follow the call to action. But the first step of being different is something that most people don't think about. They just think of, oh, what's the tried and true method for my industry? And they just gonna keep doing that. And they sound like all the other competition out there and they wonder why no one's uh, really making them feel special or really noticing them. It's because you're, all your stuff sounds the same. So think of ways to do something that's like different than what other people in your industry are doing. Um, you want to be posting, commenting, liking, and sharing regularly. Uh, it's basically kind of like the whole SEO thing. If, you, if your website stays stagnant, you're, you're going to lose ranking because the, it wants you to keep uploading new things and, and updating your site and adding more content like on your blog and that sort of stuff. Same thing for your, your profile. You want to be, people will be expecting to see content from you on a regular basis. It could be just be once a week, could be a couple times a week. It doesn't have to be like, so I see some people I follow, like they post like 89 times in a week and it's like, oh my gosh, that's insane. Um, but find a rhythm that works for you and your company and stick to it so that uh, people, they kind of build up that reputation and, and the, the consistency. So people, because they see you haven't posted in a while, then you post once or twice, it kind of ruins the, seems less professional, less uh, on top of things. Um, this isn't kind of like scatterbrain. So that consistent posting schedule just helps people show you're on top of things. You're, you've got it figured out. So that's really powerful. In general, Tuesday through Thursday is best for business related uh, posts, I usually do kind of an inspirational thing on Mondays to get people hyped up for the weekend and a funnier thing on Fridays, at least I try to do a funnier thing, who knows how funny it is for people, but um, some more relaxed and, and fun on the on Fridays, kind of ease people into the weekend. Um, and on a similar note, mornings are really good for kind of more business related posts and then in the afternoon when people are starting to get tired, kind of like ready to head home from work, um, more lighthearted fun post, get uh, more engagement. And you can schedule these things out on a tool. I use something called Connected. Um, allows you to schedule posts and automate that whole thing. Um, so it's it's not as big of a like suck on your time every day. So um, if you're interested in kind of what the results you can get from applying these sorts of storytelling tools to your marketing messaging, um, when it comes to revenue, according to research by Headstream, if people leave a, love a brand story, 55% are more likely to buy the product in the future, 44% will share the story, and 15% will buy the product immediately. Increased profits in their book, Corporate Culture and Performance, uh, the authors who are Harvard professors found that companies which successfully communicated their purpose and value could achieve profit performance that was 750 times greater than those that didn't. That's your mission, that's your why. 
uh, and those are the results of the results. Um, that's really powerful. Improved understanding of complex products and services for all you biotech startups out there with something that's cutting edge and people have trouble understanding it. In his book, Actual Minds, Possible Worlds, uh, the author estimates that facts are approximately 22 times more likely to be remembered if they are part of a story. So again, storytelling is really powerful for explaining complex ideas and a higher close rate, according to research by Dr. Robert, I'm gonna butcher this name, so I'll just skip it. Uh, people prefer to say yes to those to, with whom they share common ground in his research. Those who found similarities before negotiations were almost twice as likely to come to a successful conclusion with outcomes worth 18% more to both parties. So that again, is that why and your mission. That those sorts of stories get you these sorts of results. It's really, really powerful. So to wrap things up, we basically covered top three mistakes to avoid, which is too much about what you do, hard selling in posts and direct messages and comments, and too much jargon monoxide. You wanna be a mission with a business. You wanna be infuse that why story, that mission to everything you do, all your marketing, all your hiring, all your operational stuff. It'll just make your business way more impactful. And on LinkedIn, you wanna build relationships with people. You're dealing with humans, no matter where they are in the world, they're still human. And so you wanna treat them with that sort of respect and build connections. So, um, so before we get to the Q&A, I do have a very sure special opportunity for those of you who would like to apply what we've covered today. I am excited to announce and uh, I'm building a new business storytelling masterclass for entrepreneurs just like yourselves. By the end of this six week program, you'll be able to use your mission to quickly build trust with investors, clients, employees, and LinkedIn connections. Clearly differentiate your business in ways your best clients care about. Explain the true value of your products and services. Leave audiences spellbound with an engaging presentation and much, much more. Each week you'll enjoy a one hour masterclass session and have the option of attending a one hour live Q&A session a few days after that. You'll receive a workbook for the program before the first session so you can take notes and keep your ideas in one nice, neat, tidy place. Plus I'll throw in a copy of my business storytelling guide and handy presentation guide as an extra gift. Finally, you'll get access to a special Slack channel for your fellow participants so you can easily share ideas and give feedback. The group is scheduled to launch on April 4th at 2 p.m. Pacific time. Normally the entire package would go for $2,497 per person, but to thank you for helping me launch this program, I'm going to pay for 50% of your enrollment fee. So your investment is only $1,249 for the entire thing. And because I'm all for giving back, I'm going to donate $25 of your enrollment fee to brain cancer research. But do not wait because the, uh, to enroll because there are only nine available slots left in this exclusive launch group. If you're interested in reserving your spot, I'll put a link in the chat. And uh, let me put that in there right now while I'm thinking about it. Doop, doop, doop. Um, is that the right one? Let me uh, put this in the chat for one second. Copy. All right, and uh, there's some reviews from people I've worked with recently who love the experience of working with me. This guy is a, a IP attorney starting a new kind of compelling story for his uh, a new niche service he's offering. He's looking forward to using uh, what it, I taught him over the over with his marketing efforts. Um, these two left reviews for me on my LinkedIn profile, loving how they realized that their business was an extension of themselves and they feel way more confident and capable of uh, explaining the value of what they do. And they wanna use this messaging in their social media, their website, and even conversations with prospects. So uh, now in the chat, please enter uh, any questions you have. I'd love to hear what you think and uh, I'll answer any questions you have right now. So go ahead. Yes, we get a copy of the presentation slides. I'll be sending that with the, the recording of everything uh, after the recording basically finishes uh, processing from um, Zoom. All right, uh, question, what are the key things other than money and equity I can give to attract co-founder level marketing person to our startup team? What things would they look for in us? And where would, you, should, we, where would should we look for best talent? Um, so if you're looking for talent like that and find a co-founder, uh, checking out, I mean, do, you, do they need to be local? They need to, if they're, I guess, depending on where they're located, um, LinkedIn and uh, 
I think probably the biggest thing they'll bond you to is um, that why story. And um, they'll probably just the deal between like another, your partnership deal, whatever, the, the ways you can make that more appealing. But you're going to find a good co-founder because if, if both of your why stories resonate with each other and why you want to do what you do and the sort of impact you both want to have on the world, that sort of story will help you find the right people that when they hear your story, they go, oh my gosh, I totally get that. I feel the same way about these things. I had a similar experience. And like you guys just kind of like resonate like a tuning fork sort of thing. Um, so finding people on LinkedIn that are um, like do a search for people in like in, in your same industry who are uh, and and start talking about the core, like your mission and sort of impact you want to have and, and like the direct messages around like comments and stuff. And i uh, just going to get that message out there as much as possible is what I recommend. What you can kind of give um, not sure we can really give, but I think it's the it's more of like the mission and the, and the, the idea of collaborating with someone who shares your values. I think it's probably the biggest give you could provide them. Um, and then uh, let's see what else. What's your opinion on sending gift cards as part of a customer discovery and validation journey in return of, for, of people's time? Is that a good incentive to value people's time? Uh, it could depend on your business. Uh, depending on uh, so if you're if you're doing something that's like a like a really high ticket, like expensive service, giving someone like a ten dollar gift card for something is kind of doesn't seem that inspiring. Better than a gift card is uh, giving them something that's. So if you're in that case, if you're doing something like where you really get to know people well, um, giving them a more personalized gift could still be really like uh, like like a ten dollar sort of uh, expense for you, but showing you understand them. And like maybe some like if they have kids, like give them a little gift for their kid because they know, like, oh, this is your, your kid's favorite movie. Or like some that shows you get them, that's probably a better gift to uh, give. But actually, I know a, a woman who runs a, a gift concierge service for uh, business owners and like see executives who want to be able to give great gifts but don't have time to um, shop for themselves. So they can basically tell her about the person they're buying a gift for and she'll find some options in the price range and then wrap it and ship it and all that stuff. And it's really personalized. So uh, if you're getting to know your clients really well like that, then doing something a little more personal than a gift card is great. If it's a little more transactional, then uh, a, a gift card is, is probably good. Um, hopefully that answered your question. Where can we get a copy of the presentation? Yes, I'll, I'll send you the, the, the recording and the, the deck um, to everyone afterwards. How would you use LinkedIn to reach possible angel investors? So you want to basically uh, the combination of kind of the posts you talk about where it comes, but like, again, the mission and the results you're trying to accomplish and, and kind of like how you're going to be talking about the, the, the mission of your business and like the, what you're, and like the, you know, that, those things we covered in this presentation, posting about that and like using the right hashtags to, um, like for like, inv like inv investors, VC, whatever, like the hashtags that have, a good amount of followers and are relevant to uh, the sort of people you're trying to reach and post with those hashtags. Um, maybe if you some groups on LinkedIn have a lot of uh, angel investors, um, look up people on the search. If you have, if you have a sales navigator, it'd be great because you can look up uh, angel investors that are active on LinkedIn um, and uh, like follow them and really start to build relationships with them. Um, but if you don't have sales navigator, you can still kind of find people and, uh, and connect with them and, and follow their posts or, and like connect, or comment on their posts and start conversations. And it's kind of, you don't want to start with hard sell, like, hey, give me money, hey, give me money, because that's gonna be like, oh, I don't stop it. But if you get more familiar with them and kind of build those relationships by commenting on their posts, um, sharing their posts and like connecting with them and basically starting a dialogue, then that is a great, um, Way to get, reach more angel investors. Uh, great session. Uh, let's see what else. Not local. Um, yeah. So with the whole like work remote, work from home thing, it, it, same thing should work, Sean. Don't worry about it. Um, how do you suggest sharing of content between LinkedIn and Twitter? That's tricky because the formats are so different. Um, it depends on your if your business is um, 
Yeah, it, it depends on what you're posting on Twitter. If you're posting like um, like ads, or if you're posting kind of like uh, like announcements, that's one thing. If you're posting kind of trying to start dialogues or discussion with people on Twitter, that's a different thing. So I think it's um, you might if you have like a Twitter conversation that's kind of blowing up and getting a lot of uh, traction. Maybe sharing, I guess you could mention that on, in a LinkedIn post and I put the link to the Twitter feed or the t Twitter thread in the comments, um, like I mentioned. I'm not sure about, uh, I guess you can also link to like a, a link, to put a link to your LinkedIn post on Twitter. Um, but it really depends on it, knowing kind of the audience in both places. I think a different kind of some different uh, subsets of people that are on Twitter versus LinkedIn and different sort of conversations people have on Twitter versus LinkedIn. So you might just and like the you want to uh, you want to think it through. I'm not sure exactly. If there's necessarily a best practices for that. Um, all right, and then what else? Uh, work in the vaccine field, which is tightly regulated and not and very technical. How can I craft a story to reach other investors as they move towards Series A using animation to demonstrate our vaccine tech versus competition? So. Yeah, the highly highly regulated industries and very technical is can be very tricky. Um, you want to basically the animation is great for like kind of explaining the complex ideas, like kind of the abstract ideas behind what the vaccine's doing, and kind of showing uh, chemical interactions, that sort of stuff. Um, and the story you want to tell probably is the. Um, it depends on what like the vaccine. If you have like a some like case stories of it actually like working or like kind of the the sort of people you're looking to help um, with whatever condition they're dealing with, whatever like the vaccine is um, aimed at preventing, uh, talking about kind of the, here are people in the world that are struggling with this sort of disease that our vaccine tech could help solve. And so here, and showing people like, here's like the, you know, there's all like, like the total available market sort of thing that investors love to learn about in your decks, like what's the potential like buyer um, space for it. Uh, showing that like, hey, there's a huge problem that a ton of people will, there's gonna be a huge demand for this if we get the funding to make this happen. That's a good story to share because it gets, it kind of tugs on the heartstrings like, oh my gosh, there's people suffering and there's a potential solution that could mean a big impact on the world, which means big money for the investors. Um, that sort of story with the animation kind of show like here's how our tech is gonna work. Um, if you don't have like a clinical trials and stuff like that yet, um, which I doubt you do if you're only series A, maybe though. Um, that would be a good thing to explore. Again, obviously we want to discuss it more in detail. And if you, if you want, reach out to me, I'd be happy to discuss that more with you. Um, all right. Uh, Co-founder, why story? Okay, LinkedIn, search for comments, there you go. Um, if you have a recruitment agency, how can attract clients and investors? So um, recruitment agencies are, are, in a really tough spot right now because of all the great resignation thing and people just leaving and the kind of offers that worked pre-COVID uh, aren't enticing people anymore because people had the chance to pause and evaluate their, evaluate their lives during the kind of the shutdown and realize that, I know the stat before the shutdown was that 70% of Americans would switch jobs if they could, but they felt stuck and the pandemic unstuck everybody. And so um, employers need to basically explain more of their mission and like the impact that individual employees are gonna have with um, the company on the company's like mission and like purpose, um, how they contribute to that to really attract the right sort of people because employees wanna feel like they're working for a company that has a bigger social impact or a societal impact than just turning a profit and that their role in the company contributes to that bigger purpose. And so if you, if you help, your clients explain that as part of a recruitment agency, that will help you attract more clients and investors for yourself because like, oh, you're not just spamming out the same old, same old messaging that everyone else is, which is obviously not working very well right now. Um, and so uh, that could be a great selling point for, and like a good thing that investors might wanna go, oh, that's what makes you different, uh, which again is like the how part of what you do. And then also leads to the results. Um, that could be a way to attract more clients and investors for your own company. Um, what's your opinion on creating a short vlog cycle videos on LinkedIn to show 
a life as an entrepreneur and steps to make my startup successful. Um, you might want like one video once in a while about or like one video about your, your why story. Um, but that's way too much about you. And for the most part, once you establish like a, a second, you want like two and a half minutes or two minutes of your, like your why story, why you do what you do. Um, that's probably enough people to like, for the, at least for LinkedIn, um, people want, want to know more, they'll, they'll start a like conversation with you or something like that. But it, um, if you, if you make like the step, like here's the steps I made like to make my startup successful. It's like a, here's what you can do to make your successful. That's probably a better, like if you package it as a like entrepreneur um, kind of guide, that's a better thing than check me out at all, all how I was so successful with my own business, which is how I, how I originally read that. So if you frame it as a, um, I'm going to guide other entrepreneurs to being successful like I was, that has a ton of value because people are like, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur, I want to start a business. What do I do? And then there's like a laundry list of a thousand things to take care of. So um, it less on your life as an entrepreneur and more on like steps to make a business, an entrepreneur or business like startup successful. That can be really valuable. And um, yeah, so I think that's, that's it. Could be a good, as long as you kind of frame it in the right way. Um, doo -doo -doo. Can you use LinkedIn to perform due diligence on investors? Um, on the investors? Yeah, I mean, I guess you, uh, if you can find someone and basically do the, like look at their profile and check out their business and check out their website. Yeah, that's basically the, especially if you connect to them, um, that gives them like, usually access to a lot of their contact info so you can do deeper dives and stuff like that with other, probably need something a third party uh, kind of uh, investigative service to really do like a proper uh, due diligence if you're, if you're looking for that sort of thing, which it sounds like you are. Um, or you could just, like, if you just do the, uh, you know, the general check out what they've put on LinkedIn, that's a good start. And on the website, that's a good start. And then probably also want to check out, um, maybe there's like a glass store if it's a bigger investment company and see how, what, what the, how their employees feel, like the support staff and stuff. If it's a bunch of red flags or maybe it's not a good uh, person to get in bed with, that sort of thing. But so LinkedIn is a good place to start, but I wouldn't just do only LinkedIn. Um, if you want to do real due diligence, there are people out there that can do like really do a good scrub of a person or in their company and, and let you know all the potential skeletons in the closet that are there. What is the best way to post the podcast, the products related to real estate projects, which carry a hell of details, uh, how to present in a nice and cozy way? Um, how to the post probably, um, <clears throat> real estate projects is like if it's like selling a house or like or leasing an office sort of thing. Um, uh, <clears throat> depends on who your audience is. Uh, if you're trying to attract more, um, you basically want to like what's if you're trying to get like a more clients for yourself to basically like go through the same experience of like selling a house, whatever, or leasing an office. I'd explain basically, hey, this is the result. Like we, this company just leased, like it's a case story. Like this company just leased this office space from us. And here's what they experienced and here's what they were struggling with before and how, what they experienced working with us, how they felt the entire process. And now they have this great space that allows them to do X they couldn't do before. It's telling like a case story succinctly is a nice cozy way to um, kind of show off what you did without making it about you or the what, but you basically made the client uh, you worked with explaining like what they're struggling with, what they experienced with you and the results and how they're feeling now or what they can do now that they couldn't do before. Um, that's a great way to you know, post about um, those sorts of projects or pretty much any sort of like case story. As a creator founder, would it be wise to create a LinkedIn profile for every business? So you have two or you have, would be too much. Um, so that's one where I think having the, you want to have a separate business page for each company because that has their own like an SEO, um, like rankings and stuff as well. And you, and you probably, you could post uh, as those pages um, have their own feeds and then share them onto your personal feed. So you basically have, there's your personal profile, 
there's company A profile and there's company B profile and they're both your companies. They both have, can post stuff on their own feeds and then you share on yours and you can share yours on theirs. Um, and so you kind of can cross pollinate visibility um, and your home, on your own profile, you'd, would, you'd have both under the experience section as, and link to those companies. So I think, yeah, you could do all three of those or have all three as uh, <laughs> posting stuff and yeah, for, for every business, because each one I, I, I'd assume has separate offerings with separate target audiences and separate tones. So uh, you definitely want to separate those out and not conflate them too much on just one profile. Because if your tone and your audience are, um, are not like the are not in alignment for all your posts. It kind of make it a little confusing, and if people get confused, they stop caring. Um, uh, cancer means I'm glad you. Thank you for helping me. I'm glad I beat brain cancer as well. I appreciate the uh, the kind words. Um, all right. So, any other questions? No. Oh, one message here. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the importance of storytelling when pitching your business idea on LinkedIn, and the significance of human to human connection. Let's say I try to do that through a direct message on LinkedIn. How do I make sure that I don't come off as too informal or too petty? So it really helps to have already um, kind of commented on the person you're sending the message to comment on some of their posts and um, be a little more familiar. So it's not quite as much of a cold um, uh, message for them. Um, but you won't be pitching your whole idea to them on LinkedIn. So you want to, do, you want to keep it kind of succinct and um, <clears throat> And make it about, and if you're gonna, once you're gonna get to know them, I like to look at their profile, see what the things they, they value. Uh, you might basically, you wanna frame the ask and to basically highlight the things you think you know they're most likely that they care about. So if you know it's a, if they're, if you're going for like a, an investor that only invests in like a, kind of like the, like, um, like bone related uh, biotech stuff and you're a blood related thing, Find a good fit, but see if you kind of if you know, hey, I know you're you you're doing a bunch of kind of like a, the cell like a treatment stuff for cancers. I have this like new idea for um, a company that involves that, uh, and then and like so you can kind of tailor your your ask to them and <coughs> excuse me, make it a little more personal. Um. That might make, help you avoid being too informal or too petty because it just it shows you got to know them. And I, well, maybe like not, don't start with the ask right away. It's like start a conversation and say, like and like try and guide the conversation to that. Maybe don't lead right to it, <coughs> but um, it's a tricky one. If you want to discuss that more, reach out to me and we can try and do a deeper dive on that. But it's um, what are your best practices for creating company profile on LinkedIn? So similarly for um, the, your personal profile, you wanna, it, the SEO will scrub it. So you wanna make sure you have some good keywords in there under like the about thing, about little section. But again, your mission should go there. The kind of the, how, like the client experience you provide, the results you're looking to have with the business, that sort of stuff needs to go in there. Um, you want to, Post uh, as your business, um, and and make sure you're you have uh, those. I see that mostly like posting the kind of like articles or blog posts, and they're less conversational as a business because it's people don't know who is actually doing the posting. So you might want to if you're going to post stuff as your business and then share it from your personal profile, like share it as a post on your personal feed. That way, people don't know the face of who's like they're seeing it from the, the company profile, that will make it a little more personal and makes it allows you to build a better connection because people don't connect with companies, connect with people at companies. So if you're posting or making a, a company profile, you wanna make sure people like are visiting the company profile. Uh, you'll be posting a lot as the company, but do more kind of like uh, announcements or 
um, kind of culture sort of like videos or culture content about like what it's like to work for your company or what it, uh, things you're working on, like kind of like what the big like the mission and the initiatives you're doing and like the impact you're trying to have. But then to make it more personal, but for people, share those posts with uh, on your own personal feed. <laughs> what do you think about automated links and invites linking to in campaigns? Never do it as a place for it. Um, you can uh, do like multiple. I mean, the <clears throat> automated is tricky because if people can tell it's automated, then they're gonna get turned off by it. Because oftentimes, if you're if it's automated, they'll um, those things turn off if people respond, and you want people to respond. Uh, and if they respond, then you basically have to like do a, a personal like manual response them and actually you're starting a conversation uh so it's you can do like an, i usually have like an automated like invite i send out to people and but based on like the the search i've done those are people i'm looking to connect with so i've like that through connected i can send those out automatically but then once they connect it's all manual stuff <laughs> um because if people see you're sending them a bunch of kind of automated messages and not responding they're gonna get annoyed really fast um, and to see that you're basically like kind of spamming them because they'll see them all at once and be, oh my gosh, they don't really care how often, the, the, how spaced apart they were when they were sent. If they see them all like a big block of things for you, they're gonna be, oh my gosh, stop sending these things to me. And so it's probably not worth the risk. Uh, just like send some, like automate the initial things and then have a plan for what the next step will be, but then apply and customize each kind of next step in the process for their response and how how they respond so that it's, again, more human to human and less human to machine. Um, uh, any more, go ahead. How do you find, connect with a certain hard to find target prospects if you know the titles and company that category on LinkedIn? Uh, if you're trying to do that, I highly recommend investing in Sales Navigator. I know people think it's good to use just to spend out the, send out these spammy messages, but um, if you're having trouble finding people, Sales Navigator lets you, you have like 12 more criteria you can search for and narrow down people by, including how off like the last, if who were, like was active on LinkedIn in the last 30 days, because you might find the greatest uh, like prospect and and on LinkedIn, but they, they don't only check it like once a quarter, no matter what you do, they're not gonna see it like often enough for it to matter for you. So um, LinkedIn uh, Sales Navigator is a great way to help you really find the right people and then uh, follow them. So you're gonna get updates when they're posting things. So you can kind of build those, like make comments and shares and build those sort of connections. And then um, eventually like work on converting or basically starting the conversation to convert them. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's what I recommend. I've been doing that. Is there a good resource? We can get an actual analytical breakdown of target audiences in certain sectors like investing on various social media, TikTok. What, took, what took, can break? Or what tool can break that down for us? <clears throat> um, I do not know where you can get, a, if there's one good resource for all that stuff, I'm sure there are companies that have um, <clears throat> kind of scrubbed all that data and kind of and have, <clears throat> I'm sure it's out there. I don't know how to, uh, how, where you'd find it. Um, might want to check with some like, uh, might ask some like the, the uh, platforms themselves, like, hey, LinkedIn, do you have this sort of data? Like, do like a request? I'm sure they'll, I'm sure they'll happily sell it to you. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, the, my initial idea is basically reach out to the the um, platforms themselves and say, hey, uh, Lowell's to you on took you. Um, you mentioned Sales Navigator. What is it? So it's an it's a there's LinkedIn, there's LinkedIn Professional, and there's LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Um, LinkedIn, the vanilla version is what pretty much everyone gets when you <clears throat> make an account for free. Professional costs like 30 bucks a month and allows you to um, send more in-mails and you get a little more like more visibility and uh, so there's some other things that unlock like LinkedIn learning, some other things like that. Sales Navigator, Sales Navigator is um, uh, basically an upgraded version of, of professional where you're back, it costs like 70 bucks a month. Um, but it, you basically have a much more, like there's 12 more search criteria you can use and you can uh, save 
leads, uh, like companies and, and uh, individuals as like leads, and you can um, you get a lot more information on them. Again, it updates you when um, when they post stuff. It also shows you who like your shared connections are that might be the best person to introduce you to them. Uh, it gives you um, a ton more control over finding the right people and building strategies for uh, building connections with them. And um, so some people use it to do hard sell, cold selling stuff, which is annoying, uh, but it's also possible just to use it to find the right people and then use what we talked about today to actually build relationships. Um, and then, uh, oh, thank you, Sean. Any other questions? We saw about like, a little less than 20 minutes till I'm going to close the room, but uh, love to answer any more questions. And um, uh, if you have any questions about the master class or anything else as well, I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, yeah, we're basically hang around for another 19 minutes or so if people have questions. Yeah, so the masterclass is, um, like I said, it's, it's a six week program, it's all on Zoom. And uh, you'll basically get these, uh, this, like I said, an hour per week of like the, the content where basically cover like the why story, help you describe your client experience, describe the real results of the results you offer, um, develop your mission statement, help you with presentation design, help you with like LinkedIn profiles, website copy, networking introductions, um, helping you with the, uh, like your, um, blanking on the, the sixth thing there. Um, basically when you're like presenting or like, or networking with people, like the introductions you give, when you're like, uh, explaining the value of what you do kind of, uh, elevator pitches and helping you kind of apply a lot of things we talked about in today's, uh, workshop. And then <clears throat> you'll, uh, like I said, you'll have this kind of a group of uh, nine other people to be working with so that you can share information and, and uh, experiences. And there's that open Q&A every week. And it basically helps you uh, apply a lot of things we learned today and get some uh, like direct help with your, with your questions and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> I'm a CEO, founder of an early stage startup. I'll make our first corporate LinkedIn profile in the next few days. What can you say that will help me? Um, I don't know if you, uh, when you join, we're basically starting with uh, why you started your company and what your mission is and um, <clears throat> what your, the impact you're trying to have and, and explaining the, um, <clears throat> yeah. Oh, hey, Sean. So uh, the, the, for this initial uh, group, the uh, total investment needed is only uh, 1,249 for the entire thing. So normally it's 2,500 bucks, but I'm uh, paying for half of it for the first 10 people. So, yep, exactly. Um, so for, for the initial, Startup uh, to reply to Gary's question. Um, really make it about the mission and kind of what you're trying to accomplish and the impact you want to have, because that'll draw those initial people to you who care about the same thing. And as you build up your, uh, is there a payment plan for the, um, sure, we can do, I mean, usually the, the secure spot, there'll be a deposit that you have to make, which is basically half of the, 1249 because it's 625 for the whole thing. But so if you want to do a payment plan, yeah, we can email me or I basically uh, fill out the, the form when you click, we'll go to the link, fill out the form. And um, and uh, when we, I'll send you an email with more information. Basically, if you want to do a payment plan, we can do a payment plan. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm like, as I heard from my story, I'm all about helping companies that are dealing with uh, finding new treatments and solutions for cancer because. I've been through chemo and radiation and they, they work, but they still suck. So um, yeah, all this stuff going on with immunotherapy for cancer is something I really wanna help support. So 
Yeah, if you, if you, there are payment plans available. I can we can come up some with something if it's, uh, that'll help. But um, email me or go go through the the Bitly link and the stuff like that, and I'll. Uh, um, yeah, there you go. Uh, follow the link, and I'll. Um, when we're do the email to follow up, but you basically say if you're interested in a payment plan, and we can discuss those sorts of things. Happy to make things work when it comes to cash flow concerns for people. I get it. Um, any other questions? We have about a little less than 15 minutes. So happy to, who here is left? Anyone left? 47 people left. So yeah. I'll send more information about the masterclass and stuff when I send everyone the recording and the, the deck and uh, all that fun stuff. So if you want to review that and uh, make sure it's uh, the right fit for you. I get it, um, but there are only a total of nine slots left as a, uh, but when we started this this proposal or pr started this presentation. So um, don't wait too long. Uh, any other questions about LinkedIn and messaging and storytelling and attracting investors or clients or employees or uh, that sort of stuff? What Discord have you dug into Discord as a platform? How do you have hacked the attraction effect there? Um, I'm a part of a few Discord groups. They're more for I use them more for like a, a a social thing than really like a. Um, I think that's usually more about by influencers. Depends on probably in your industry. If you're, uh, in the sort of business where you're just like a B two C sort of thing or like, like a content creator. Discord and like and like um uh what's the thing they're always talking about Patreon are super super popular kind of like the, if you don't have one of those and you're a content creator it's like what have you been doing making content um yeah Patreon um it's basically for like uh people can donate and become a patron of uh content creators and artists and stuff like that so it's a way for content creators to supplement their income instead of like just getting the like the stuff that YouTube uh, pays them. Um, so if you're trying to build, if you're a B2C company and you want to build like a community, um, those are can be good. Although the, the better thing to do is build a community on a platform that you own. So it can be good. To have, you have a LinkedIn group, you can have a Patreon, you can have a, have a, um, a Discord server. Those are great, but if like Discord changes like their policies or um, Patreon changes something, uh, or like they basically like you get like banned or blocked or flagged or something like that, and that's your only way to connect with your group, your community, you're hosed. So you want to basically build like an email list that you can control, that you own, because no one's taking away email, um, and have like a, some redundant. Uh, platforms or like a platform of your own and then like some other third party ones to help funnel people to your like website or like basically like to your like a forum or some sort of uh um your email group or something that you own yourself that can't be taken from you um so uh that's probably the best way to use those that don't rely on a third party platform for your entire business i heard people go i don't have a website i just have a linkedin profile it's like well if that goes down or like, or LinkedIn changes their policy or like you get banned, your whole business grinds to a halt because you're on LinkedIn. So you wanna make sure you have, um, like use the third party things to get visibility and, and build, start conversations and then funnel people to your email list. Or if you have your own like a website with its own forums, which is probably really expensive for like a, and hard to manage for a startup. But like, um, so email is probably the best way to basically keep a track of and communicate with your community um or do like and like organize kind of like other like events and other platforms but like your main thing should be something you own that you can control so if some goes sideways on a third party one you're not just sol that sort of thing um glad you made some connections max um 
There's more reinforcers you're having. Uh, building a community is really, really powerful. And, and the mission statement is what's going to, and like that why and mission is what will attract your, your followers to your zone. There's some good ways to get folks from big social media over to our own comment and chat room on our app. What are the, some tips and tricks? Um, you want to basically, uh, there's some kind of campaigns you can do where there's, um, depending on what you're offering, you might offer like a, some sort of like special deal for they um, bring on, like they like bring people to the platform or they come themselves to the platform or they, you basically might, you might just basically make posts on the third party platform saying, hey, here's a cool thing. If you want to see it first, check out our own platform. We'll post like, again in like a week later on the third party platform, but we're going to see it first come to ours first and then so you're gonna get first access, exclusive content, exclusive offers, and then basically um, promote all those exclusive things that they can only get from joining your chat on your app on all the third party ones. So people can be, be part of both, uh, but they only get the like kind of premium content, premium offers, special status if they join your uh, first party app. Um, what is what if it is B to B to C? Would inbound marketing using podcast driving to my website be effective? The website includes free educational content to show benefits and services. Yeah, B to B to C is tricky because you kind of have two different audiences. You can have stuff that sells that appeals to the business and also appeals to your the clients of that business that you, like they usually like the end users. Um, so we basically have like a some content aimed at each one of them. You don't want to do like both at once. That can be kind of confusing and kind of muddle the messaging. Um, podcasts are great for sharing stories and um, having good calls to action, like link to the website, because you can put stuff in like the description of an episode, that sort of stuff. Um, don't show the benefits of services, show the results. Maybe meant results, but show the results of the services, not just the benefits. Show the impact of the services. And you basically want to have like if you're doing the, the podcast, I have one episode that basically aimed at the, the business audience and have some that's aimed at the uh, customer audience um, and have, uh, just, you have to make sure that when you're releasing content that it's focused at one of those two. If you do want to do one that's aimed at both, you basically want to have, tell a story of how like it, the, what you do it helps the business that then helps their customers and kind of show the entire journey or the entire like ripple effect of the impact your company has through that B to B to C um, relationship. Um, episodes would invite both providers and pre previous clients to tell. Yeah, so uh, when they're telling their stories they're having it show how it came basically from your company through like, and show the experience they had through that provider um, and like make sure it has a ton of emotional and like evocative language. Like, don't just say, hey, we did this and then this and this and this, and then that's the result. Like we did this first. And at the beginning, I felt like this and I we was really struggling with, I remember I was like, couldn't sleep like for like the fifth night in a row. And I was so tired and I was really stressed out and it felt so awful. And then I heard about this service from this right. Oh my gosh. It was like, I can't believe I was, I didn't know about this before. And they made it so easy for me to get the solution I wanted. I can't remember. I remember walking in the first day and getting greeted so warmly by the receptionist and felt like initially I knew immediately that this was going to be perfect. And I loved how they, I got to experience these sorts of things. And at the end, I got this result that, oh my gosh, my life's so much better. And now I'm able to do X, Y, and Z that I couldn't do before. And I'm sleeping like a baby and I can recommend them more to anyone else in the world. Um, that sort of helps it go from like what you offer through the provider from the clients as a hero all the way through the end. And so it shows that impact, but it, other customers or clients who see that go, oh my gosh, I'm not sleeping well because of, I'm stressed about the same sort of things. I totally get what this person's feeling. I want to be treated that way by the sort of provider. I want to have these results. And if you hit them with a call to action at the end of that story, they'll be like, oh my gosh, where do I sign up? Um, that sort of thing. So it's amazingly powerful um, story if you tell it in that sort of format. Any other questions? Oh, here we go. So when they do find come to our platform, they're really quite uh, platform. 
Um, yeah, I mean, getting people to, the having more, there needs to be a reason for them to, to, to be on the platform and be more active. So having like events or like, um, they need to have some sort of incentives. Um, um, you want to have, but maybe ask them, ask your, and both, instead of trying to guess, put out a survey, put it on like the third party uh, platform, put it on your platform saying, hey, what do you want from like the, the first party platform? What would get you more engaged? What would you find, what would you find valuable and make this experience worth it? Uh, you get more, how can we give more, you more value on this platform? Um, Oh, sorry, Rob. Um, question was, um, when they do finally come over to our platform, they're really quiet, just wondering why folks aren't engaging like they might on a larger platform. The content is there and there are live people just posting things daily, but folks are not showing up or not speaking up. Any thoughts on what we can do to look at ourselves? I suspect it's a UX mission relevance, non-herd pull issue. Um, uh, so yeah, basically, poll, ask them. Um, it's much better to just ask people what they think. People love giving you their opinions, and 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 ask them will basically show that you actually care, because you want to like you want to make sure that they're <clears throat> getting value from the experience. Obviously, if you're asking them, say, hey, we want to make sure you're spending more and more time with us because we want to sell you more crap. That's not a be a great way to go about it. So think about it from like we want to give you more value experience from being on this platform what would give you the most value what would uh inspire you to spend more time on our platform because you'd be getting <clears throat> value from it like you actually care about and so and then give them like a <clears throat> some incentive to fill out the form like an actual like discount bonus special offer um and get that information and then they'll tell you what they want or what they think they want and then You'll have to try some things and tweak it some because what people say they want, what they actually want is always not the same thing. But at least you give you a better sense of what to do than just guessing. So only about two more minutes and change. Any last minute questions before I end the session? You're welcome, Sean. Any other questions before the end of the session? Do, 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 do. All right, we have about one minute left. All right, no, actually two minutes left, two minutes left. Oh. Any last minute questions? Do you want to join a startup? Uh, I'll consult with you as a third party. Be happy to chat about that. Um, you're welcome, Ty. Glad this has been helpful. I love practicing what I preach and giving away value, helping people out. Seriously, Sean, you're like, you have my email right there. You have my phone number, smoke signal, interpretive dance, whatever you want to connect me with. Reach out, we can chat. You're welcome, Caroline. At least you're Caroline's iPhone. Hopefully it's Caroline on her iPhone and not someone else, but you're welcome. Thank you, Sean. I'm glad you found this awesome. My, my goal is to inspire awe in people totally with my presentation, so. <laughs> Less than a minute left. Guess pretty much at this point, you got my email, you have my phone number, you have the link to the masterclass thing. Um, I will be following up with you guys with the recording and uh, the, the slide deck. Thank you all for coming. And I'll be ending the recording in about 30 seconds. Yeah, it is Caroline, so glad. <laughs> uh, 
All right. Thank you all for coming.